All right, let's start on time for a change. So good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your ITF week. Uh, this is the whimsy birds of a feather meeting. And I can't uh, spell out whimsy. We'll get to it. Uh, I'm your own chef uh, with Joe Salloway. And yeah, let's get going. So, and of course, uh, thank you to the scribes, to the volunteer scribes. Um, please uh, note the note well, it applies to this meeting, just like any other meeting at the ITF. Uh, both uh, IP-related uh, uh, issues are covered, as well as uh, anti-harassment and uh, uh, code of conduct. So please review it carefully. The agenda for today is quite heavy. We have a large number of topics to cover. Uh, there will probably not be time for questions, or maybe just a little bit. Uh, we will be very uh, serious about uh, timekeeping. So please have that in mind, especially if you're presenting. Uh, we will start with introductory material. Then we will uh, talk about some proposed uh, uh, deliverables uh, for the working group, if one is formed. Um, and we will end with a large chunk of uh, open discussion, including, of course, uh, both questions. Um, as a reminder to everybody, we are having a side meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock in Carling, Carlin 4, wherever that is. All right, so where are we? We actually have a nice uh, acronym. Stand, it stands for Workload Identity in Multi-System Environments. But WIMS is so much nicer. Thank you to the proponents for coming up with a great acronym. And a mailing list. We have a mailing list. The mailing list has been quite active. Um, please keep it active if we want to actually create a running activity from this, it will happen on the mailing list, mainly on the mailing list. Today is a non-working group forming both. It is not a goal today to decide on whether this community here uh, would like to form a working group. However, we will be asking some questions to gauge the feeling of the room, to understand whether we believe this is an activity that the ITF should take on. And of course, uh, even if this is a non-working group forming BOF, uh, it doesn't mean that we need to have a second BOF. We might have a second BOF in Brisbane, or else we might move forward um, even all the way to creating an actual working group uh, in between uh, the ITF meetings. And with that. Uh, just, just one note, please sign in with the online uh, attendance tool so that we ha can uh, mark your attendance and so you can join the queue uh, to participate in the discussion. While I'm waiting for control, I'm uh, I'm Peter Castleman, workload identity enthusiast. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of context for why we're here. Um, one of the challenges that we see um, happening right now with our customers and in the industry is that a very large number of customers are running their workloads in multiple clouds, multiple uh, service environments, uh, and they really have no good ways to 
reason over the identities and to protect those uh, workloads uh, or deploy zero trust architectures. Uh, and so you end up in a situation where you have to learn multiple identity systems and that in turn turns into this sort of big challenge around uh, you know, not having the right skill set and not being able to really secure everything. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the background for why this work is interesting to us and why uh, we've been bringing this um, uh, uh, to, uh, to the IETF. Um, maybe, Yaron, you can just sort of forward to the next slide if you can't give me control. We're still working on it. Okay. <clears throat> So when we think about workload identities uh, or identity in general, you kind of need standards for lots of things, right? We need standards for identifiers, credential formats, uh, how we're going to do attestation, secrets management. We need standards around how we provision, what our provisioning mechanisms are, authenticate, authorize, um, how we federate across multiple trust domains, right? And then finally, things like monitoring and remediation, right? So if something goes wrong with the workload, we need to know which workload on which machine, and we need to be able to go and intervene. For all of that, we also end up needing uh, things like policy and configuration for each of them. And then finally, uh, you need to be able to prove compliance against uh, your, your definitions. So we really need sort of a set of standards to deal with all of this so that we can manage our workload identities. But the good news, if we go to the next slide, you should have control. Oh, I have control now. No. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Um, should I have control now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, so. The good news is, of course, we're not starting from scratch. There's already plenty of standards in this area that we can leverage. Um, specifically standards, and not only standards, but also let's call them community projects uh, that's developed in places like the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Uh, something like Spiffy, the secure production identifier framework for everyone, uh, it's actually sort of uh, ticks a bunch of boxes, right? From identifiers to credential formats, attestation mechanisms, provisioning, up to federation, and uh, and then there's of course all, all the work that we've been doing in the IETF around things like MTLS uh, and various OAuth um, uh, standards for authentication and authorization. Uh, there's also um, you know work happening in terms of policy languages um, and work with the OpenID Foundation shared signals framework specifically as a mechanism for us to. Uh, uh, to sort of disseminate information about uh, security events. And then, of course, there's work with SKIM and TEEP and uh, RATS, all of these relevant that help us solve these problems. And I am told I am now in control. Ah, the power. Um, and there's actually even new work coming to the fore, right? So things like the, uh, CEDAR is another new policy language that has some wonderful properties in terms of verifiability and provable security. Um, uh, and um, I think we sort of have a lot of work happening in lots of places, but one of the challenges is, of course, um, there is a gap. So I'm going to try and talk very quickly about the sort of things that happen. So when we try and go end to end and we try and build this on standards, um, you know, you'd start with the resource owner, um, uh, and that transaction, right, sort of, if we look at that, um, there's sort of a set of work that's covered by OAuth, there's a set of work that's covered by Spiffy, but there's also a bunch of challenges, right? So for these workloads, these individual workloads passing requests around inside a compute environment, uh, things like request binding. Uh, how do we make sure that the origi original identity is retained in a secure way? Um, how do we keep, uh, you know, how do we avoid challenges with client registration in the OAuth world for these workloads that need to sort of spin up, connect to an OAuth server, uh, and, and then sort of go away again? Um, uh, there's a bunch of challenges around resiliency, latency, authorization, um, audit, and compliance, right? These are sort of gaps that, that appear. There are standards for each of those things, but it's not always clear how you should use them um, as you cross uh, between these sort of standards. 
So one thing that we've started looking at is how do we connect these different ecosystems, right? So how do we connect something like the work in Spiffy with some of the OAuth work? How, how do we connect shared signals framework back to Spiffy, RATS and Spiffy, Cedar and the OAuth uh, RAR um, uh, specification, for example? So these are sort of places where we can potentially connect these things. Um, but there are also gaps that are not necessarily uh, as simple as just sort of getting a profile of one thing or another. And I think for that, I just want to check if Evan is online. Hello. Good morning. Afternoon. Hey, Evan. So, uh, so as an example, I, uh, one of the things that we discussed on the um, on the mailing list is this idea of a request binding. And Evan, I, you can tell me to just sort of move forward. But maybe you can describe a little bit about the kind of challenges where we sort of almost have all the pieces, but then doesn't quite fit. And so maybe I'll also let you introduce yourself and then uh, maybe just walk us through that example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Evan Gilman. I work on the Spiffy and Spire projects. Um, I've been <clears throat> working on this stuff. This workload identity focused stuff and been doing that for about seven years now. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, I have an example here of it is a pretty vanilla jot that is kind of the typical shape that you'd see in use for workload to workload security. Um, this is like super broad strokes, you know, a little bit hand wavy, but there's a couple differences here from, you know, tr traditional OAuth OIDC centric jot use. Um, the first one is that there's usually a pretty tight expiration. Uh, this is because of the replay nature of these things. You know, you can pop them off, put them onto other requests and stuff like that. It's kind of not my favorite thing in the world, but um, Jot is the closest thing we have to interoperable token for workload identity auth. So this is this is what is typically used. Spiffy uses Jot in this way. Other other uh, mechanisms like in, in Kubernetes, uh, projective service account tokens use similar mechanisms. Uh, so there are these kind of like skinny Jots, if you will, uh, there's usually an audience and it's an identifier of some other workload you're calling. Subject is the identifier of the holder of that token. And sometimes you'll see an issuer set. Uh, there, there are some kind of ways to get rough OIDC compat with these token validations. Uh, it's not required. Sometimes you, you distribute the validation keys through other mechanisms, but it, it is one, one way that it can be done. And so there's been a lot of pains in dealing with these tokens. Um, you know, how do you, like, so you usually have to be minted centrally, right? And when they have a short expiry, that has some um, implications on availability and performance and things like that. And um, <clears throat> the biggest problem I, I, is really just kind of the security around these things. As I mentioned before, it's just bearer token. And so that's why we kind of keep the TTL so short, the, the, the expiry so short. And we've been looking for ways to mitigate this if at all possible you know audience and expiry are the best two best things that we have that we can kind of come on top of the existing specs with if you go to the next slide uh so when depop uh, was being worked on and i got wind of it i was pretty excited because i thought this is a really great pattern uh, that we can use to kind of patch up this gap that we have in in the replayability of of jot and service to service off and so um, I started talking with some folks in the community and started taking a closer look and thinking, okay, you know, how, how can we take this and apply it to workload to workload security? And the more that I looked there, the more I kind of realized that it, it will be pretty difficult to use the spec as is. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. There, there were a few things that jumped out at me. Um, the first thing, which is not really a blocker, but was kind of a curiosity, was the placement of the JWK and the proof itself. I know there, there are pretty good reasons for doing this and, and OAuth, but in, in these cases, it felt, felt way more natural to just put the JWK in the workload jot, right, as a CNF claim, for example. Uh, that, that, that is, 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 you know, getting kind of closer to <laughs> X509 certificate, right? But it, was, it felt very strange to have to, like, have the validation key in the proof of the thing that is actually signed rather than have the, the key attached to the identity bound to the identity. Uh, so that was a little bit of like an ergonomic thing, but certainly, you know, in, in the sake of reusing standards can, can, can kind of look the other way on that. And then the, the, the more I looked, the more I went down, the, the, the kind of more difficult the problems got. Uh, you know, I guess this, this access token hash is in the same vein as the JWK. It doesn't, doesn't quite make a lot of sense in workload identity world. And then 
the final nail in the coffin was this HTMHTU claim, which is used to bind uh, the DPOP proof to an HTTP request. And that is kind of like exactly the, the behavior that we're looking for, but these particular claims are required by the DPOP library, uh, by the DPOP spec rather. And the whole DPOP spec is like very HTTP centric and, and it gets us quite a ways, but it doesn't get us all the way. There's lots of other things we, we need to secure like TRPC, which doesn't really conform to these things. Kafka, PubSub, um, things of this nature, right? And so what we really need is something that's a little bit more flexible, be able to kind of choose bindings depending on the protocol and, and request response patterns that, that you're using. The DPOP spec requires these to be set. Uh, you can set them, you can maybe set them to some garbage thing or none or something along these lines. Null doesn't work too well with across like various libraries and things like that. So Sorry to interrupt, but we're we're at time. So okay, sure. Uh, that that's that's basically it. I, I took a look at some libraries how, how to use these things. They're they it's very difficult. And so the question is really like, do we abuse this spec? Try to make it work in our way, or do we write a new thing? And if we write a new thing, where do we do that work? Thank you, Evan. Very quick question about uh, uh, slide two, where you were showing the whole spectrum of the, all the standards and everything. I am just curious, where does this come from? And is there a pattern starting from the bottom to the top? Is there a connection between the things that you show on slide two, or is it just randomly just, you just placed all the blocks? Oh, uh, no. So I went through a process of looking at all the standards that we can find that we are aware of mm -hmm. that can help solve parts of the problems that we see with workload. So that is not a random selection. That's kind of a, think of it as a curated selection. I am no, fully no, uh, willing to accept that it's not complete. Just to clarify, not about the standards, the diagram that you showed, which goes from the identity up to the, oh, the, oh, the attestation, oh, that's authorization, line. and so on. Is it... Is there some pattern or is it just randomly? Just... Um, no, again, it, there is a pattern, right? It sort of builds from the bottom. You start with an okay. identifier. On top of that, you have a credential uh, format. Then you need to start thinking about how you're going to do it, attestation provisioning and so on. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the shape and the sequence does matter. Okay, right. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> you have it. Ah, okay. Yes, I have buttons. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin Richer. And uh, Peter, don't go too far. You're in this one, too. Uh, <laughs> um, we're, uh, we're here to talk about some uh, workload identity use cases. So uh, really, fundamentally, I, I want to start with this question of, you know, what is a workload to begin with? Uh, and a workload is really, uh, we, we can define this as a single piece of software uh, that, that does a specific purpose. You know, it's not just software in general, it's something that is designed to do a specific purpose, uh, fulfill some specific need. But the thing is, that may consist of a lot of running copies of that same software in order to fulfill that need. And uh, each of those copies of the software fulfills the same task. And that's the whole idea behind, uh, you know, workloads in these data centers that allow us to do the kinds of scaling that we can do today. So what's identity got to do with any of this? Well, it turns out you need identity in a lot of different places. Let's say we've got three different cloud services, three different uh, things, and uh, we wanna be able to uh, identify each of those so we know what each of those pieces of software is supposed to be doing. You know, a workload is defined by what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, so we wanna be able to differentiate there. Uh, Spippy uh, and technologies like it allow us to give identities and keys and certificate stores and stuff to these workloads and it solves uh, part of the problem. But it, uh, it actually raises a lot of questions. So with things like Spiffy, we can have the services call each other and, we, and they know that they're calling each other and we can do binding to MTLS and stuff like that. And we can do binding to JOTS like uh, Evan was just talking about, even though that's a little, little iffy at times. Um, but the thing is like that doesn't answer the whole set of questions. In protocols like OAuth, we abstract the entire workload concept, this whole like series of different things calling each other. We abstract that into something we call the resource server. And the resource server is just 
a functional role that a client software calls and it goes and gets the things. Now, that abstraction is really helpful because it allows us to have resource owners uh, that talk about the resource servers and however that gets fulfilled, the client software and the authorization server, none of that generally need to know anything. Um, but the truth is, if once we get down to the uh, level of actually having to implement anything, we get all the way down to that leaf node inside this chain of services, it's going to have a lot of questions to ask. Who is the resource owner that said that this was okay? Did the correct chain of other pieces of software get called before this request got to me? Uh, you know, did this uh, request come from an authorization server that I might not have any direct insight into? And if so, how do I know about that? And how do I even start to reason about that? And so this raises a lot of questions uh, like, uh, you're, you're going to see copies of this diagram a bunch of times today. Um, uh, when uh, Peter did the overlay of, you know, the OAuth happens kind of in the, in the corner here and Spiffy kind of happens inside that light orange box. How do we cross that boundary and reason about that in a way that actually makes sense? Let alone a way that is interoperable because the world just keeps getting weirder from here. Uh, because any of those nodes can go off and call a whole other set of uh, workloads in order to fulfill its job. And this is where the multi-system, multi-cloud environment really starts to come into play. Because one of those nodes can go off and uh, we get all the way down to that second leaf node in the green box there. And it's going to have a whole stack of questions that it needs to answer. That might need to know that the proper chain was followed in some other cloud before it got all the way down to me. And how do, we, how do we convey that information? How do we start talking about that? And of course, this gets weirder still when you realize that all of these external services that are functional roles that we've abstracted probably have their own internal state and systems as well that uh, sometimes we care about, sometimes we don't. Uh, or uh, you can go use mine. Um, so we've put together a, uh, a use case document, which you can uh, scan here. And uh, Peter is uh, going to go through some of those now. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll talk through a set of use cases that we, const that we uh, wrote up over the last couple of months. I uh, want to uh, encourage folks to please go read it, scan the QR code if you're brave enough. And um, uh, so let's talk about those, right? So I think first, when we look at uh, sort of this constrained credential security, what we really mean by that is, how do we prevent token replay when these workloads are presenting their identities, uh, the jobs uh, that Evan described to one another, right? Um, when it is compromised, how do we prevent reuse, right? So that is monitoring and remediation. Um, and then how do we do this so that we can use asymmetric credentials? And how do we do that in a standardized way that'll work in all the different compute environments uh, that our customers are using? Um, then there's sort of this idea of cross workload access. Um, so how do we avoid, uh, so in OAuth today, there's this concept for client registration. But you can have tens of thousands of workloads and registering each of them individually can be very problematic uh, or, you know, it, it's just difficult to manage. Um, you want to access different workloads from different service providers and uh, also uh, in different cloud providers, right? So it sort of starts spanning more and more environments. And we need to do that in a, in a standardized way. Um, I see someone in the mic. Should we, are we okay to stop? or do we want to leave that for later? Yeah, we, you can call, clarify a question. Yeah, um, hi, Eric Criscorla. So can you just go back to a couple slides because I actually got up to ask this question before. Um, yeah, one more, yeah, there. Can you explain to me what the threat slash trash model is here? Namely, how much do these boxes trash each other? That's a great question. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I was hoping for an answer, is that okay? <laughs> The, the, we, there is not a universal answer to that question. And, and that's one of the reasons that I think that we need to be able to uh, have a language to be able to reason about these kinds of things. Sometimes, um, you know, in, in a lot of deployments today, you get uh, the leaf nodes will be completely trusting of the gateway. And as long as it went through the gateway, they don't care anything else that happens. Sometimes that's not the case. And um, especially when you get into this multi-cloud environment, sure. you need to know, you know, some sort of transitive things have happened before it well, gets I, I get, Well, that's actually what, I, what I'm just trying to push on a little bit is like, so you sort of said, well, you know, do I, 
if I'm like down at Quux, right? Do I know this went through Foo Bar, Gateway, Baz, and whatever, right? And like, it's one thing if I'm trusting Baz to assert that it went through Gateway and Gateway to through a bar. And it's quite another if Quux has to be able to verify that the thing came all the way from the user. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to understand the scope of the problem. Uh, I, to me, those are both valid ways to try to answer the question. And so figuring out what the scope of what a potential group would want to answer is, is part of the reason we're here. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, Yaron, I noticed we're sort of out of time. Do we, do we proceed or do you want to just um, have folks continue? Do we have time left on the, we're at, at the 10 minute mark for this presentation. Yeah, if you need two more minutes to, to complete the presentation, that's fine. Okay, well, what I'm gonna do, instead of sort of flipping through them, I'm just gonna talk about the use cases in general. Uh, another one is the strain of custody of requests. So knowing, uh, I think building on this earlier question, knowing who had access to, or who was in the path of this uh, set of requests. Uh, also, um, how do I make localized authentication and authorization decisions? Because we have these requirements around low latency and uh, high resiliency, right? So we need to try and make these decisions as local as possible, but that comes with, you know, changes the trust model. Um, set of requirements around audit logs, right? When we operate in disconnected ways, how do we reconcile those logs, right? What is the process? for a workload that's been disconnected from its control plane for 20, 72 hours, how does that workload, um, uh, you know, rational, how do you rationalize those audit logs? How do you bring them back together? Um, and I think we talked about authorization and specifically this need to do it locally. Uh, and then a set of general requirements is described in this document around observability uh, and manageability, et cetera, right? So again, I encourage folks to go read the use cases. Um, happy to talk more about them, but that should give another framing of the set of problems that we're hoping to solve here. So Evan, you're up with uh, Spiffy. Hey folks, Evan Gilman again. <clears throat> um, I was asked to do a quick intro to Spiffy here just because I know it's kind of the term has been popping up a little bit. Um, so what I'd like to do is just, sh just share a really, really quick kind of tour with you and a quick explainer to set some context. You go to the next slide, please. Uh, so Spiffy is a workload identity spec. It lives in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It's fairly widely adopted for some measure of widely, runs on million machines worldwide, millions of machines worldwide. Um, one interesting thing about it is authorizations out of scope. We deal purely with identity and authentication from software service to software service. And there's a handful of things that um, it seeks to solve in that area. The first is, you know, basic identifiers. How do you identify a workload? Reason about that. Uh, how do you credential them with those identities? Uh, how do you issue those credentials in a platform agnostic way? And finally, how do you federate between different domains of trust? So you go to the next slide. This is what's called a spiffy ID. So this is the identifier portion. Um, so you, it's structured as a URI, and the host component here is what's called the trust domain name. That's that's kind of your issuer equivalent. Uh, everything that comes after that is is the identity of a workload that lives within that trust domain, if you will. You can go to the next slide. And then uh, we credential workloads with this scheme essentially by defining profiles over existing document types. Spiffy doesn't really invent new document types. Rather, we, we reuse uh, document types that have been defined elsewhere and are generally in wide use. So Spiffy supports today X509 and JOT. The specs are set up in a way where we can support additional documents in the future as they become available. And this is just kind of a handful of the of the constraints that, that we place on them. We place these constraints, in, you know, number one for interop, uh, but also number two because um, some of these things have questionable security properties, as I was mentioning earlier on the, the JOT use. So you go next slide, please. Actually, if I could just ask a quick clarifying question on that last slide. I'm uh, just wondering if the, those two are alternatives or if they're composed in some way. Uh, they, you can use them either or. They're not, they don't go together. We see people use them together frequently. So we'll do like an MTLS channel and then, and then that goes kind of hop to hop and then over the top, a JOT is attached to the request. 
is a common pattern, but you don't, there, there's nothing in the spec that talks about explicitly using them together. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so the next thing that, that Spiffy defines is platform agnostic issuance. This platform agnostic bits are really important because a lot of identi existing identity systems, for example, cloud IAM systems, even Kubernetes, are kind of uh, domain specific. And so when you cross those domains, those, those assumptions fall apart. Uh, so Spiffy has this platform agnostic issuance. We define something called a workload API, and it's a, a effectively a node local API that is unauthenticated. So when workload comes to life, it attaches to this workload API, and then the Spiffy implementation, which is serving that workload API, quote, attests the identity of, of the workload. Um, sometimes there's a two-step process where an agent uh, works to attest the identity of the node, and the agent turns around and attests the identity of the workload by interrogating various subsystems. And uh, the, the end result of this is a workload is given a certain key or a jot. Workload can ask for anything it wants, uh, but the implementation determines the identity of the workload and, and issues a short-lived um, credential in response. Go to the next slide, please. And then finally, uh, Spiffy supports federation. It does this by basically uh, grouping the keys up into a JWKS document. Uh, we set a use field to kind of define which flavor of, of credential is, is the one that the key represents. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, we package up both X509 CAs and, and JOT signing keys into one document. And doing this, we can do MTLS across trust boundaries and things along those lines. Um, so if he also defines uh, OIDC-like mechanism for fetching and distributing these, these bundles. And then finally, um, there's this component we, what we call Spiffy Auth, which involves, okay, well, how, how do you authenticate these credentials? It first involves plucking out the Spiffy ID, examining the trust domain that it was signed by, and then consulting a list that you've been distributed of various trust bundles and the trust domains that they map to. So why am I here? Um, Spiffy already has a place to live. It, it's quite happy where it is. Um, this is not a request to move it or anything along those lines, but uh, there's a lot of related cases that, and, and gaps in the ecosystem that are very closely related to Spiffy, uh, but, but not quite in scope for Spiffy itself. And I mentioned before, Spiffy doesn't invent document types. So when we talk about trying to solve problems which involve new documents, this is kind of a little bit uncomfortable for our community. And token situation in particular is quite difficult with the security availability and performance requirements we have and you know state of the kind of open open ended state of, of jot spec and something like depop would be great uh, so there's a lot of existing works across various standards bodies that that we want to leverage and you know i think historically we, we've kind of done a poor job at at talking across those boundaries specifically in the context of workload to workload security and so here to start that conversation and engage with you all that's all I have for today. I know there were some, uh, does anybody want to come? There's some talk in uh, the chat. Does anybody want to bring any of those to the mic or? I'm not familiar with the SFC use case that was mentioned in chat. Eric? I guess I'm just sort of trying to figure out how this all fits together. Um, may, maybe maybe I'm just not very not following very well, but um, like there's a lot of different pieces of work that are being discussed here. And it'd be helpful to a map of like how, oh, then, then I will look forward to your presentation. I'll sit down. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm toast. Uh, yeah, I quickly updated the slides to address all your comments that you didn't even ask. Um, so a colleague of mine, Benedict, and I put a document together in contribution to the, to the BOF um, to look at one specific aspect as a sort of a kickstart on, on what type of standardization work would you actually would be doing. So you see what the, the document name is. Next slide. So uh, Justin conveniently provided already a good introduction to what workloads are. And he also explained on like why they need to talk to each other. And or at least that's, it is a common case that these different workloads um, require some form of communication and authorization. So it's, we're talking about the distributed system here. And 
those workloads like use REST APIs and uh, for all of you who are familiar with OWASP, you know, like we have these regular OWASP communication and these clients, OWASP clients need to be provisioned with secrets and these workloads, while their code is generic, they need to have configuration and credentials that are unique to an instance. And in OWASP, we have a couple of different ways to do this. Client ID and client secret is one of them, but it turns out uh, not a good way to do that in this context with a high highly dynamic context where we want to rotate the secrets. We want to have them um, the lifetime bound as, as uh, uh, Evan just mentioned. So we want to have something better. Next slide. And so how could we use that better, namely some other credential types in OAuth? And quite conveniently, um, many of these container technologies that manage these workloads like Kubernetes or, or also Docker, they come with a control plane as they call it, essentially protocols to start and stop and maintain these workloads and also provision them. Uh, and that's where the JWT comes into the picture. Next slide. So when you look at these Kubernetes and Docker uh, documents, then you will realize one thing, at least from, and I did uh, as an ITF person, like there are lots of new terms, like these people just invent new things out of thin air. Um, and the slide uh, here says, like, this is not a term I came up with. This is literally what these guys use. Like, this is the name for a token. Can you imagine? Service account token volume projection. I don't know what that means, but it's a, it's a JWT, um, which is configured to a workload. Um, so it, that makes those documents hard to read. And they are not, uh, the security properties are not well explained. Like even writing that thing down in IETF language, uh, like how OAS is used in those contexts would already be of tremendous help for the community to reason about the security properties. That alone would be enough for me. Uh, but in this document, we went one step further by actually looking at uh, some of those configurations, then they conveniently use uh, RFCs that we worked on in the OWASP working group. So you would think like job done pretty much. Um, not quite, uh, next slide, because there are issues. Um, so here is, this is a simplified drawing on how Kubernetes and, and some container technologies use this whole dance. The blue one is sort of what happens outside the workload. And basically there's some interaction going on between the control plane and the agent that sits on, on different physical hosts. And they, these agents are then responsible for starting the workloads and configuring uh, credentials as they start them so that the workload has some unique instance properties. And then they kick off the actual, another sort of authorization server interaction to really talk to uh, whatever other workload and Justin talked about that a minute ago. Um, and so, so in some sense, a pretty simple model. Um, and you would think if you take a JWT from, and get it from the comp control plane, it gets down as this, in this weird uh, name of a token, gets sent over to the workload and then you go from there and it would work, but unfortunately not. Next slide. Because the implement, so there's no specification uh, on how you would actually do it. It's mostly just code and some implementations do it that way and the other ones do it differently. And so if you take an authorization server and plug it in there, it's likely not going to work because they populate the fields differently you know, you can do a lot in a JWD. You can populate things uh, in one place and then in the other, no problem at all. But if you want to have some form of interoperability, you need to pay attention to what you put where because there are some checks executed. And interestingly enough, people mix up the RFC that talks about um, the uh, JWD client authentication with another profile of it in uh, OIDC and then nothing works. Um, and so that's what we, in this first iteration of the document, described. We describe on how you need to populate the field so that uh, you can have interoperable implementations. It's kind of simple from a, for us coming from an, um, from an OWASP working group, uh, because we, we obviously know what the fields mean and how you need to populate them. But uh, 
the impact is quite nice because you can then use off the shelf software. You can then um, sort of benefit from the OWASP mechanism, which allows you to easily rotate those tokens and then uh, do the authorization dance. That's the need even for that little uh, document for which I see a justification for having a working group to discuss these type of things. And Evan just mentioned another one. If you, this one talks about bearer tokens. He talked about proof of possession tokens. If you add that on top of it, of course, it's more secure, more, but also more complex. It requires more text. Next slide. Profile. This, this is a profile best current practice. Take the existing stuff, munch it together in the right way. And so I believe um, there is value in providing that guidance on how to use some of those technologies we worked on for different use cases in this context. And that's what we did with that document. Eka, did that somehow answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Marco, I believe you're online. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Oh, Roman's in the queue. Oh, Roman, did you have a clarifying? Uh... Hi, Roman, did you no hat? So that was a great kind of presentation. Is there a way to crosswalk that against the use cases we previously saw? So if we just did the BCP use described, are any use cases taken off the list that that were there that were aired earlier? Okay, may I start? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I First, I, I, I want to, to thank you everybody for the opportunity to be here, talk about the, the work that we are doing since 2021 in the SPIF Assertions and Tokens Work Group. My name is Marco. I'm a PhD student at USP, and this work has been developed together with other universities, HP and, and the SPIF community. And I will talk about the nested token model that solves some of the discussed problems that maybe others not. So uh, let's see how it fits everything. Next, please. So I, I think that's a good way to start here is to talk about the requirements and goals that bring us here. And we started uh, working on a way to have uh, the centralized mechanisms that allow any subject, any workload to create authenticated statements. And to do that, we developed a, a simple token scheme that supports extension and incremental signing, basically something that we cannot achieve uh, currently with uh, JWT tokens. And the idea is to have a scheme that we can add some set of claims, but we need to keep in mind that this, these tokens should be size sensitive and we at least try to, to make it cheap to sign and validate. And also we want to, to have support to different kind of identity documents and pseudonyms because we are not, uh, we at least doesn't want to be tied to a central or local authority. We need to do it offline if need to. Next two, please. So the, the model that we are working on our proof of concept uh, it's a token construction. Basically, we, we like to call this uh, as a technology agnostic because we are not uh, working to, to develop to a specific uh, technology. But in our proof of concept, we are focusing in a JSON-based model. And this nested model uh, have three parts. We have the payload containing the claims. We have the signature, of course. And we have an optional uh, part of this token that's the nested that can contain another token that we extend. And when we think about the claims here, we, we, are, we try to keep as open as possible. So we do not define some uh, critical and mandatory claims, just a few that is strictly necessary to run the, the, the scheme. But there is one, one important kind of claim that's 
we go further on the on the description that are the identity claims like issuer audience for example and in our scenario in our model we define in, with three different possible values so an identity can be a spf id for example a common name uh, could be a public key as a unique identifier or could be an entire identity document of course if you think about an x509 or or things like that it could be an uh, something not reasonable to put inside a token and that's uh, uh, an important point that we are working on a specific use case for that that i will show that next please so uh thinking about this token structure what we have constructed until now is this kind of nested scheme where as i say the token can have a nested token inside it uh, in our proof of concept, we define some specific claims to the payload, to the payload but we can have any other uh, according to the application needs. And as I say, we have something uh, uh, like the identity claims that have a specific type of values. And again, we can have a token inside it. So with this kind of construction, we can uh, achieve many of the that use cases that we talked before, and we can construct very flexible tokens using it. Next, please. Uh, okay, then we go a step further and talk about the signature schemes that we can use in our, uh, in our token. We, we are planning to implement in this first phase of the proof of concept two different modes. One, we call ID mode because it's backed by identity provider. In our scenario, we are using the Spire environment to provide those identities. And this scheme uh, allows to identify the, the signer of, uh, the, the, of this token. And also this binds an issuer to a unique audience. So here we cannot define more than one audience. The idea here you will see is to create a link between them and to easily track all the, the hops that the token went through. And in the anonymous mode, otherwise, uh, on the other hand, we, we don't care about the identification itself, but we need to grant the, the token uh, integrity. And also we are using some tricks uh, with cryptographic algorithms to aggregate the signatures and create smaller tokens. Next, please. Uh, so just a few details about the ID modes. So here the audience uh, ha has an important role in this in this mode because this is responsible for linking uh, each of the, the signatures. Basically, if you take this flow here in the image, uh, like ID1 creates a token and send it to ID2, ID2 will be the audience from that ID1 defined it, and ID1 sends the token and sends the its certificate or its identity document uh, together. And the validation consists in checking all the signatures, checking uh, the identities, and check the links between audience and the next issuer to for all this this token. Okay, next. So here, just a simple example. Imagine that we start with that green token. ID1 creates that and set ID2 as the audience, embed its own identity document inside this, this issuer claim and sign it. Then ID2 can extend it using its identity as the issuer and pointing to ID3 and every hop in the, in the flow can use this mechanism. And to validate this token, then we check all these links and we'll check all the signatures and then finally check the identity documents of every hop. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi. Eric Skrola. Um, I guess I'm trying to understand what this proves. So by the time I get to three, three knows, as far as I can tell. I mean, so I assume there's like that the, the data has changed in between here as, as things are processed, right? That is, yeah. we're not just running four in the packets. We are like, like things are happening along the path, right? Right. Okay, so like what assertion can ID3 confidently make? It seems to me it can make the assertion that some data passed between one, two, and three and was transformed in some unspecified way. And all I know is like there was some data that happened, right? Is there a stronger assertion it can make? Yeah, I think so. Well, what, what assertion can it make? 
I guess, so, so like, let me, let me like, let me, like, let me try to like actually discuss like an actual kind of threat, right? So I, uh, ID one is like do a money transfer of like 50 bucks, right? And in the middle, okay. and, and, and so like that, it's like, that's in the initial, like in the initial JSON token, it says $50. But one of these guys is compromised and changes it to $5 million. How is that detected? Yeah, but imagine so that ID2 is compromised and then try to change the, the token that ID1 created, but it will should fail because uh, first of all- it doesn't, change, it doesn't change the token. I'm saying that I'm saying there's other metadata being carried around here, right? Like you're not just passing the packets. This is associated with like data, right? Yeah. And, right. So, and so that transformation has to be checked. Yeah, but we are checking by validating the signatures and the identities used to no. create them. No, no, no. Okay, I, maybe let me try again. So, like, the, like, I'm the the. So I mean, like, I mean, I give you like a, a really concrete example, uh, trying to at least, which is like uh, the thing comes in and it comes in in JSON, but it has to be translated to Cbor for someone later on the path, right? And in the process of the Seaboard translation, I like change the values too. How does that get detected? What I'm saying well, is, is, the problem is the problem is like the consumer does not, the, the consumer at the end of the chain, ID3, does not consume the thing that started ID1. He consumes some other transformed data along the way, typically, in these workflows. Yeah, but, uh, and so how uh, does he verify uh, I, the logic is correct all on the path? I, I don't know if I, I got exactly your question, but. Uh, uh, what I can say is that uh, since we have an identity authority behind all those identities used to sign it, if anyone tries to modify the token along the path, or it will be detected because it will need to generate a new signature to keep it valid, and we will detect it through the wrong identity used to create the new signature, or it will not be able to modify at all because it doesn't have access to the original signature, original key to use it to generate no, no, this. That's a, that's a statement of cryptography, not a statement about, about, about reality. Um, it's not a statement about, about trust, it's a statement of cryptography. I'm talking about saying different. I'm talking about one of the two being compromised and misbehaving, which is the point of having the signatures is to deal with this misbehavior. And I'm trying to understand how it detects that. Because as far as I can tell, what it detects is some other property, which is a property about like, which if I, I'll see maybe. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's a, there's other work happening, but one of the aspects I think you're addressing is there are aspects of a transaction when it starts that should become immutable, regardless of how many work loads it passes through. Right. And if you establish that transaction context as immutable at the beginning, you know, through whatever that mechanism is, right. Then as it passes through, the, all these other services, they can't change it, right? So they can't switch it from $50 to 500 million. Yeah. And I think that's a different aspect. I mean, in this particular case, ID1 could have in its token said, in addition to these other claims, here's some immutable context that says it's being transferred from this account number to this account number and the total amount is $50. And there's ongoing work to look at that as well that I'm not sure we're talking about here today, but, um, but I think that's where that the question you're asking overlays with this. This is about sort of, you know, chaining the paths. And I don't know, Justin, you're going to talk about other ways of chaining paths. But um, but I think you bring up a really good point that in any of these flows, when you have a transaction that starts, there's aspects of that transaction that should become immutable at the beginning, and we need that as another piece of this overall work. Yeah. Thank you for your comment, because uh, that's a good point. Uh, we, at least now, we are not uh, worried about the content itself of those claims, but we are trying to create a tool that then applications can use to, to construct its, its content and maybe create new logic that can be put over that. Great. I, I think, so like, that totally makes sense. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, if this is work as you chartered, there's going to be a document, which is a problem statement, which describes what the charter work is supposed to be. And I'm trying to like home in on what that, what that document is going to say so that we know when we're done, right? And I think that's like, maybe it's going to come up, but that's the part I'm trying to home in on. It's like, what, what are we trying to do and we're not trying to do? Okay. Some are from you, Justin. I think I, I, I also, st I'm struggling to find out the node number two, which is the issuer for the third statement. And I still do not understand how you are saying that it could be compromised, it's, but it's still, the system could still work. 
so if i understand correctly what you were showing showing on slide number 6 was that the node number 2 the previous slide if you go back so so there we were showing that the probably the node number 2 if it is compromised the system still works is it is it that so uh, i don't i don't see a direct connection between the slide 6 and 7 so can you clarify a little bit about the is there right. a claim that the id2 node is compromised it's that that's a good point yeah because uh, here we 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 are working on a spar environment so if you id2 is compromised probably that will be a window of time that this will be compromised too because we are not rotated the key yet so if the key is compromised and it's still valid it will be a problem and we will need to deal with that in some way that we have not find yet and probably we need to discuss more to to understand but the idea is to take advantage of that uh, slow uh, validation time that the spf identities have and we try to mitigate this using this uh, slow small extension uh, a valid time so if the the key is compromised yeah that's a problem but we we are try we try to mitigate with smaller uh, validation but time but i don't see but i don't see any way that, that you are proposing which which kind of mitigates this how does this mitigate this so it is that's the kind of the flow which is the id number 2 is signing for id number 3 right so so right. if the oh. key side that signing key is compromised i don't see any way how it could establish a connection with id1 that that data coming from id1 that and the key for id2 is um, uh, I, compromised so I, i don't see how it's protecting that i think maybe we should move on with the presentation and and because okay, sure. we may be going in a direction that's not not what this was pointing at sure. so okay so of course i don't have uh, all the answers here because it's a work in progress but it's good to know and and have those feedbacks because it will be interesting to discuss internally so okay so please next slide uh so let's talk very fast about the anonymous mode which is a way to create this kind of binding between the signers but without specifying the payload who is the audience because sometimes we have a load balancer or or something like that between workloads and we cannot assure which wor workload will receive this but we also doesn't we want to use a lot of audiences so how do we do that so basically we are using an aggregation scheme here using schnorr signatures and basically imagine there uh, id1 created this token id2 receives and use a key extraction algorithm to take the token signature and then this key extraction algorithm returns a partial signature that is half size of the original one and aggregation key and this aggregation key can be used to extend the original token and this creates uh like a signature chaining that binds one signature to another and if of course we are sending this token on the uh secure channel only the the receiving part will be able to access the correct key to extend the token so the idea is at the end of the the day uh the target workload will receive this token and take all the signatures together and validate it and if it's valid we know that uh, it passed through the the nodes that should be next please here the the same example just to to understand better what happens so basically green part originally has a full signature but it was extended we have just partial one issuers here are just public keys because we are not then find them and this blue token then have two partial signatures and a full signature and using the aggregation mechanism we can validate it and know if the token is entirely valid or was uh, somehow modified and we can detect that and and then we can reduce up to 50% the signature size because we were uh, extending using part of the previous signature uh finally the as a future work we are uh, trying to develop this kind of hybrid mode where we take the aggregation key combines with the expired private key and then we have an hybrid key uh, specifically to each token and then to validate that uh, in our issuer claim we have two values an identity document that's backed for example for part by spire server and we have a public key and then we can use those issuer values to combine them 
and get a uh, hybrid public key that validates that signature. Okay. Uh, finally, a use case that we have uh, to the nested model is the lightweight SVID, which is the nested model applied to the Spire server scenario, we are, where we are working on the creation of a small and flexible identity document. Basically, Spire server creates something that we call lightweight SVID, and Spy agent and other workloads can extend it, adding new claims to attenuate to or create delegation scenarios. And finally, the last one uh, of the proof of concept that we are developing to this uh, new event document that we are working is it have some requirement. Basically, we want to delegate WALF permission to a specific workload. Then we need a way to create and validate the, all the chain of custody of this token and grant the security. The token should not be modified in any way, and we need to, to grant the link between all the hops and be able to add uh, arbitrary claims. For example, in our scenario, we are adding selector claims from the attestation process. And that's it. Thank you. OK. Yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, I'll try to be quick here. Um, as soon as I can do the thing, okay. Uh, Justin Richer here again with uh, Ori Steele. Hi, I'm Ori. That's Ori. Um, oh, there we go. And uh, we're here to talk about token containers. So we just saw a kind of token container. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, you know, generally speaking, we use tokens like access tokens and things like that to limit access to. AP uh, APIs, but HTTP generally gives us one place to put the token in the request. OAuth uses the authorization header. This is a sensible way to put it. You can cram it in URIs and other stuff if you really hate security, but uh, by and large, there's really one, uh, it, with every request, there's kind of one place to put one token. But what if we need more than one? And that's kind of the fundamental question that I wanted to ask here. Uh, the reason for that is uh, for a lot of the scenarios that we're talking about here, we've got multiple systems and multiple objects that want to make different statements about what's happening. It's not just about an access token anymore. We want an auditing service to be able to say, yeah, I did the auditing and here's the results. So this gets uh, back to a little bit of Ecker's question of what is the transformation that I did? Uh, I want to be able to make that statement. And that's not really changing the nature of the transaction. That's just another statement about the transaction as it's flowing through the system that I want to be able to make in an attested way and uh, pass that along. Uh, you know, software bill of materials uh, that uh, we heard. No, wait, that was in Spice this morning. Um, sorry, the, the whole week is, you know, flowing together for me right now. Uh, and it's only Tuesday, folks. Um, but uh, but ultimately, uh, my, my real point is, is the last bullet there, and that's that we've got this habit of treating everything like an access token, uh, because that's kind of the box that we were handed. And so we've got this habit of taking stuff that really isn't an access token and cramming it into the access token spot, because that's kind of what we have to play with. And I contend that that's an anti-pattern, and that there's a lot of uh, cases where we want to talk about multiple different things happening, in ways that uh, isn't just dealing with access tokens. So for example, I told you you'd be seeing a lot of this diagram. Um, in this kind of system, we want uh, each of these different pieces to be able to make different statements. You know, The client is making the statement uh, effectively. Here is the access that I have. That is a traditional access token, but really only once it hits, hits that gateway. And the gateway needs to be able to say, I saw this and I processed it, or I just looked at it and it was on the request, or whatever statement it needs to make and be able to pass that along. Um, and every time that we go through the system, sure, we can pass that token along, but it's not really acting like an access token in the same way anymore, especially if we think about sender constraining. Right? The client is the only party that's supposed to be presenting that access token as an access token. Everything else along that chain, it's not really an access token anymore. It's a sort of context to the ongoing request in the transaction. And again, this gets really weird when we start to talk about multiple clouds and the types of things that we do. And sure, we can wrap tokens and we can do token exchange and we can do things like that, but we lose context and sort of make it more difficult every time that we do that. 
So I would like to uh, raise the possibility of a multi-token data structure that would be carried along transactions like this. I've got a draft that talks about this that I posted to the Whimsy mailing list. But the basic idea here is that instead of treating this as a linear system, we treat this as a graph. And every time that you get a new statement that you want to make about the transaction, you can add it to the graph. And I really don't care what's inside those individual statements um, because that starts to be, get to be really application specific. Um, you know, it could be, I audited this or the account had enough money or whatever you need to do. But what's important, I think, is that we have a container that allows us to uh, carry these bits of information along with appropriate metadata that says, like, this is the slice of the application that did it, and allow it to be attested to by different parties in the system in a way that lets you add to this graph. So what does that look like? Um, uh, if Because I uh, needed to pick some variable names when I uh, did a test implementation of this, uh, each of these things is called a bucket, and you put all the buckets together in a crate. Yes, they're terrible names. Uh, and ultimately, if this starts to feel like a Merkle tree, there's very good reason. Okay, so I've got one token on the way in, and uh, I, I take the value of that token, which may or may not be an access token, but front door probably is, at least the first one, and I add a bunch of metadata to that, and then I hash that. I uh, serialize that out in a deterministic fashion. I create a hash for that. Great. Um, and at that point, because that hash is set, that value is fixed in the graph. I can't change the metadata, which also means that I can add a signature on top of it. But in this case, I'm signing just the hash value. That means that the signature is not covered by the hash, but we can do some tricks with key identifiers in order to tie the signature to the hash and all that other stuff. But it also means that people that don't care about this particular signature don't need to be bothered by it. Because I can start adding other uh, structures to this, and I'm not going to talk through all of the different branches here, but one of the fields here in this serialization is that P field. Uh, that is a parent structure. Any token, any bucket that's already in that graph, uh, I can reference as a parent structure. And the way that I do that is by referencing the hash of that token without its signatures. So uh, I really, it's, you know, it's very Merkle tree-ish. Uh, so I say that this is the parent to that, which means that if you take this and shake it hard enough, you get this nice little uh, directed tree. And uh, this tree has a bunch of really interesting properties to it uh, as you're passing things through the system. Not the least of which is that should I need to go uh, and call a subsystem that only cares about the value in say T4, I can trim everything but T4 and T1 and hand that off to the subsystem and still have a perfectly valid tree. And when I get the results back, they could have augmented T1 and T4 with any number of other nodes. I can add them back into the tree and it's still self-consistent. And that allows me to kind of manage the data as it goes through my really complex multi-environment, multi-cloud system in a way that becomes really powerful. This is a graph and graphs are snakes. Ori? Thank you. Um, so I'm basically here just to speak about the different uh, cryptographic mechanisms for achieving these graph structures. So um, this is your last slide. Yeah, yeah, I, I okay. kind of already talked through it. So go next ahead. slide. It, you have the next slide. That's ah, I got it. My I've got it. Digital credential workflows. This is my way of thinking about these scenarios. You've got, uh, what's the workflow? It's a sequence of industrial or administrative steps, uh, other processes through which a piece of work passes from initiation to completion. For me, I deal with credential workflows a lot. Those are really just uh, models of workflows in the real world or of a software uh, workflow that represents some complicated process. And a credential workflow for me is a, is a workflow that's secured with digital credentials. Uh, this could include identity documents, which seems to be the word that I'm hearing in every session, um, and it has you know, a potential application of digital signatures or encrypted envelopes. Uh, I work on um, securing supply chain integrity and transparency at the SKIT working group, and we look at uh, transparent workflows for supply chain uh, use cases. So for uh, the supply chain of a software artifact, how is that software artifact produced? In the context of applying that to a physical supply chain, what steps of physical transformations occurred from the raw material to the finished product, the certifications along the way, et cetera. 
for me, a transparent workflow is a credential workflow where messages are stored in some verifiable data structure, which enables new messages representing proofs of inclusion, consistency, these concepts of receipts, endorsements, or evidence. And in the structure Justin just described, that capability is kind of built into the envelope that's sent. Um, in the context of uh, Skit, we use a, a structure called a transparency service. It's an ecosystem role the transparency service provides that can enable that capability. And you can put those together. You can have uh, a selective disclosure or a graph structure that has redaction capability built into it as a message. And you can put that complicated graph, cryptographic object into a transparency service that then enables those components as well. So I'm, I'm mostly here to sort of describe that overlap between you know, what I see, the, op the things that folks within Whimsy are reaching for, and the things that I have some familiarity attempting to build over and over again. Next slide. Oh, uh, no. Nope. Yeah, sorry. A lot. A lot but, uh, okay. Hi, Roman Dillon, no, no hat. So I see a lot of, so I just walked out before lunch of, from the Spice Boff. And I'm hearing a lot of the same words, and I'm trying to understand whether we're just using them differently or they're interconnected. So I heard digital credentials, which in the Spice Boff meant I'm building a CWT with, I heard unlinkability this morning, I heard selective disclosure. So is this work taking the, what was the credential representation, I think, I think is the word we use? As the the corner the, the the kind of cornerstone of this, I asked because the previous presentation seemed like it was presenting something dramatically different than what we talked about this morning. Yeah, so I just need some help here. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So um, uh, the previous presentation and this one and even Hannes's are all uh, sort of approaching this problem space kind of in different dimensions. Uh, the previous uh, one was describing one way to do sort of an accumulative, you know, linear nested structure in order to uh, talk about how you chain stuff together. Uh, my uh, proposal data structure here is how we break that linearity to solve some problems where that linearity doesn't actually help us. Is there a way to reconcile those? I'm not sure. How that relates to the stuff in Spice is um, that each of the, the dark blue boxes there, I, this data structure, I am fully convinced, needs to be agnostic to what's in those. But somebody needs to figure out what's in those. Uh, because you want to be able to reason across those in order for uh, to, in order to make sense of, like, is this actually secure? Like, th this can tell you the graph is self-consistent, but if it's self-consistent garbage, that doesn't help. Um, so I still need a way to be able to identify, for example, particular uh, people and workloads across boundaries in ways that start to make sense. That's where some of the spice stuff might come into play um, or as even a container for this. So if I could replay my understanding, I should not try to link together what Hanna said, what you're necessarily saying or what I heard because these are not necessarily complementary approaches. And so they may tackle the use cases I thought I saw in the beginning. Uh, they may tackle part of them, none of them, or they may even tackle the same ones in a competing kind of way. Um, kind of, I think Peter probably has a better answer for this. I think the way to think about all these different things that you're seeing, Roman, is they're all ways to solve different aspects of the use cases. Uh, some of them may be, uh, I wouldn't even, wouldn't even say competing, right? There are different ways that may both be valid as a solution at different points in time, right? There are challenges that we may need to solve very urgently for which we probably don't need more advanced cryptographic techniques than we already have. Uh, some of them are things that may be five, 10 years out. Uh, we need to think about how we will solve those things in the future. So I think there's sort of a time dimension to this, uh, but then again, they're also a, in, they're not all addressing the same use case or said there are use there are many use cases, and they're all being addressed by different uh, proposals. Right, and there's also a contextual aspect to this too. Like for example, uh, Nahanas' presentation was about if you are on uh, Kubernetes and you're using this something projected something or another token thing. Um, 
I can't remember the acronym, but uh, if you are using that, then there's a certain set of ways that you could actually make that make sense. That's a very, very narrow uh, and very immediate uh, problem solution space uh, that uh, might feed into, say, how do you get the stuff into one of these blue boxes here? Um, but it also might be, so in that way, it might be complementary, but it also might just be solving a different problem at a different part of the stack uh, at the same time that this is solving something else in a different context. So they could be separated, they could be together. And I think that one of the reasons that, uh, that we're proposing more work in this space is to figure out where those gaps and where those overlaps are. Because I think that a lot of people are hacking together solutions today without that sort of larger thought of how do these things fit together? Where do they complement? Where do they conflict? And, uh, and how do we even start talking about that? Uh, hi. <clears throat> hi, this is uh, Dimitri Zagadulin, MIT DCC. Uh, so this is everyone's favorite topic of hash links, right? The, so, so my question is inevitably, uh, have you considered either IPFS style CIDs or RFC 6920 naming things with hashes or the um, naming things with IDs and hash fragments? Thanks. Those are all great questions. I just wrote this in Java one afternoon, so no. Um, but they're, they're all great questions. So uh, this I proposed it as, I, I would like a data structure to exist with the following properties. And if there are more clever, better ways to get those properties, I'm, I'm all for it. And uh, I'm passingly familiar with, uh, with most of the stuff you listed off there, uh, but not enough to be able to say, this is a perfect fit for the kind of thing that I wanted to do. So the, I literally implemented this with like SHA-256 for my hash function. And uh, I think I used like ES-256 out of a Jose library to do this signing. Um, really brain dead, um, but just to prove the point that it could be done even with dumb crypto primitives. If there's a better way to do that, let's, let's talk about that too. All right, yeah, I'm gonna, graphs or snakes? Right, so um, this is an overview of like the concept of a uh, transparency service and the role it plays in supply chains. So in a supply chain, you have upstream components and downstream components. Justin's comment about the linearity versus graph structures. Many people think of supply chain as just this linear thing, but it's actually the graph thing that he's talking about before. The supply chains are very complicated. One of the ways you introduce confidence in those complicated scenarios is by creating this concept of a transparency log and then having information flow through transparency logs. And every time you do that, you're creating a kind of one layer nested token thing. The first layer is the sign thing and the second layer is the transparency logs receipt on the sign thing. So this structure here essentially shows you the sign statements, they come from some first producer that guy does registration, some policy evaluates application specific information. If success that goes into the transparency log, a receipt is produced and that sign statement and the receipt together become a transparent statement. This then feeds back into a potentially very complicated loop. And then that leads to at the end of the day, complicated and valuable uh, productions from these supply chain ecosystems, these value networks. In the case of an identity workflow, that could be a delivery of a complicated uh, experience and valuable experience to some software consumer. In physical supply chains, it could mean that you got your device and it had all of the things that it was supposed to, all the certifications were done, compliance checks were met, et cetera. So I'm, this is just essentially to present that view of the same sort of uh, set of challenges that you've seen here. Can you advance? I've got a bunch of uh, like working code and skit related headers here, but I don't think that's maybe not the most useful yeah. thing for us to do here. So um, at this point, you can consider my part uh, concluded. The one comment I would make is that ju what Justin was and what Roman was asking about and what Justin tried answered there is a, some repetition you're seeing at different layers. Every time you see that repetition, it's not necessarily doing exactly the same thing that it was doing at the other layers, but there's a lot of 
repetition and that repetition is valuable. That's why you're seeing it being repeated. Um, Manu? Yeah, uh, uh, Manny Fontaine with Hashmesh uh, made a, a similar comments in other sessions. Uh, there's a theme here, indeed. There's layers, as you said, that repeat themselves. Uh, it, it turns out that I think there's a layer that's underneath all this, which is a uh, you know, universally um, trustworthy cryptographic bedrock of some sort where you could you know, actually get automated cryptographic key management and get um, software identity, people identity, organization identities be registered in an infrastructure of that sort. So this is now uh, becoming possible thanks to confidential computing, TEs and all that. I wanted to bring that up uh, in this context because uh, the identity of software is actually also related to vulnerability tracking uh, and then be able to just go and, and react to software deployed out there. So um, registering hashes, uh, inherent identities of executables into a globally trustworthy cryptographic fabric would actually be extremely beneficial uh, across you know, virtually every application. Thank you. Ecker, did you want to bring your? Um, so I guess, can you just help me understand what transparency is doing here? Because usually transparency is about preventing equivocation. But if this stuff is all signed, like, it's like, and you could like, 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 yeah. help me understand that if it's in the context. So I'm not sure if transparency services are providing any value here. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm mostly here to sort of say, you see, you see this nested token thing. Here's mm -hmm. another place you see nested tokens. Got it. The use case for those nested tokens is about uh, a, performing this digital notary process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like as a notary, I may authenticate you, but I'm not going to look at the document that right. you're signing on, right? So that document has application-specific detail. Yeah. There are workflows where that's the property that you want, where I just want to authenticate you, and I'm not going to look at your document. There's, work, there's other cases where I'm going to authenticate you, and I'm going to look at your document and I'm going to apply a really complicated validation policy. And only then will you get a receipt from me. I don't know if those use cases apply here or not. I'm explaining the building. I, block. I see. So I should maybe th be thinking when, when I see this, I should be thinking counter signature, perhaps more than like CT. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. The counter signatures is another uh, building block. That's very much like the other ones discussed. All right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think one of the most important things for folks to take away from the, the whole kind of suite of presentations today is that there are a lot of common patterns out there and those patterns are sometimes happening uh, with solutions at different layers than what a workload type system would actually be dealing with. So we're not saying necessarily everything that was brought up today is like, oh, this is stuff that Whimsy should be doing, but it's stuff that Whimsy should be paying attention to because... We should either be copying the best stuff or, you know, influencing outbound. The, the token graph structure thing, I originally came up with that structure not to solve anything related to workloads, but to solve um, migrating uh, human user identities across federated domains. You know, I need to be able to trace things and it's a graph and it's all this other crazy stuff. And I need to be, to be able to talk about that kind of thing in that space. And I realized that there's probably some applicability here too. And uh, so, yeah, I think that there's stuff that's happening at a lot of different layers that you're going to see echoes of. And uh, I think recognizing those echoes is going to be really important to figure out like where the actual edges and scope is, which the chairs would now like to talk about. All right. Thank you, Justin and Ore. Um, all right. With that, we would like to bring some of this uh, into perhaps better focus, and then uh, open it for discussion. So just to remind you all, this is not a working group yet. This is not even a working group forming both. And everything, just about everything, is uh, open for discussion. We will have a set of uh, both questions at the end of the open discussion. Uh, we did have some discussion on a proposed charter on the list, and I would like you folks to take a quick look at the charter scope. Um, 
when the working group started to address challenges associated with fine grain least privilege access control for workloads in this and that uh, scope. Um, so we do have a scope uh, of what we would like to address. And then whether we take on specific deliverables, that's up for discussion. And we will talk about some of the principles. Uh, so the goals that were proposed uh, on the mailing list are to establish best practices and the document that Hannes uh, talked about is uh, an example of such a best practice. So taking existing technologies and deploying them for least privilege uh, author uh, workload uh, authentication authorization in a specific environment. That's a best practice. And this is the kind of uh, uh, documents, a kind of documents that uh, we would like to, uh, to publish within the group. Um, next is to identify gaps in existing standards, like even an other discussed. Uh, so some standards that are almost there but cannot be used for workload authentication because of this or that reason. And then whenever a, a large gap, or whenever a gap is identified and it is not being worked on uh, in a different working group or even a different uh, SDO, the working group will also produce uh, uh, proposed standard documents. Uh, that's the proposal uh, that was made in the charter. And this is a graphical way of, uh, of uh, describing it. So we will be working on, so first of all, this is in priority order. So some of the things uh, we, we talked about today may eventually become in scope of the group, but not immediately. Uh, we will be starting out with uh, use cases uh, based on existing uh, technologies, uh, sorry, with use cases for workload uh, authentication authorization uh, in an abstract way then we will be publishing an architecture document tying it all together and attempting to, uh, to resolve the use cases uh, as far as possible uh, with existing technologies, but also identifying uh, gaps in, in these technologies. In parallel, we will be publishing uh, best current practices that are point in time. So best practices may be appropriate today, but as the technology improves, as we come up with possibly better solutions, those best practices might not become best anymore and might even get deprecated at some point. Um, as, as, uh, as we said, um, we're not out to grab a, a huge scope of, uh, of standardization work. Much of the work uh, will be done in other working groups, and that uh, certainly includes auth, could include SPICE. Um, the SPIF, SPIF itself is being done in, uh, in C, uh, CNCF. Um, does possibly relevant uh, work in uh, OpenID Foundation, all good. Um, if there are still gaps uh, that need to be standardized for uh, workload authentication, that will be on us. And with that, we will open discussion. 
Eric Prescorla. So I think, you know, I'm persuaded by these presentations that there's a bunch of interesting work to do here. I do not think this is a good plan of work, however. Um, and the reason it's not a good plan of work is the charter is actually incredibly open-ended. It just says like, we're going to fix problems associated with like workflow orchestration. And the ITF does have working groups like this, working groups where we develop some technology like OAuth, and now we're kind of like filling in gaps over time. You know, this also happened, you know, with, um, you know, you can see TLS does this, you can see SIP does this, but these are not technologies we invented and they're not architecture we embedded. This is like other people's technologies and we're being asked to fill in the gaps. And, um, and that is not something that, I, and, and that is like a recipe for like a, um, Katamari of like ridiculous work that like no one understands. Um, so um, I would suggest quite the opposite um, approach. Um, um, one or two, one or two things. One um, is a very tightly focused working group to do one or two of the things it says on here, and then if that goes well, we can move on. Or alternately, um, a, a, if you want a much broader scope, a working group which starts with the architecture document and then fills in from there. But I do not think what you should do is be like, we're going to have a working group, which is just going to fill in unspecified holes, and then later we'll build an architecture. That is like a recipe for not good. Um, so like, I'm enthusiastic about doing the work, but like, I don't think we should turn it that way. Roman. No, no, no. We're good. Um, yeah, I agree. So the... Um, uh, so the, the goal, at least from initial conversation, was to actually identify a handful of specific things like, you know, Hannes's document, which is very, very narrowly focused um, by design, and also, uh, and also put together what Peter and I had been calling uh, a sort of a general BCP, but Yarn wants, to call, wants us to call an architecture. Um, but to specifically do that, and in working on that, find out where the gaps are to do more work. Um, so if, if there's a better way that we can express that in the charter, please help us with that language. Cause th what you described was a lot more the intent of what, at least what Peter and I had going into that charter. Um, and so, yeah, we would, we would love to have that be more clear as to what we meant by that. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would propose the way to handle that would be basically to take what you just said, stuff it after like those opening paragraphs and then have the work items B do those things. And then we can recharter with new work items to different things, as opposed to kind of having it just be like a grab bag maintenance working group the way like a lot kind of is now. Hi, Roman Dinu, no hat. Uh, this is partially duplicative, I think, to what just got said at the mic. I guess I read that charter text and it reads like the words for a standing working group. And what I don't understand about this space is why do we need a working group to figure out what the problems are and just have this open ended thing and then we'll kind of work them? Do we not know them? And so there's something different about the space, which I, I don't understand. Colin Jennings, Cisco, can you go back a slide, please? Just so that one, I think it helps. Um, so I, I'm going to be saying almost the same thing you've, you've heard from other people here. So I, first of all, uh, a year ago, I was just wishing somebody would be making something like this happen. Like, this is awesome. Like, I'm really glad to see this type of thought coming together and very supportive however I can. And I'm happy to help work with you people on writing charters or whatever else. Um, that said, uh, I, I, I think this is a very risky place to have a very blank check open charter. I think we should be naming very specific things that we're going to do. And one of the reasons why is this is a huge magnet for people's work that was rejected at other SDOs to come and re-resurrect re it again here and, you know, figure that all together. So I think that the direction I would really go is, again, reversing the order a little bit of this, is the use cases and the architecture and gaps do that first. And as you get your architecture and gaps clearly straightened out, start forming the, the documents you need about how to do things. Now, I understand what the words best current practice mean if you look them up in the dictionary, but that is probably not quite, you're probably going to have a lot of pain and suffering if you're trying to do this all as BCPs at the ITF. You probably are talking about usage documents or something slightly different. I think the documents you want to write, I 100% agree with. I probably would, I would want to talk to you a lot more about why you thought they should be what a BCP, just that three letter acronym as one unit versus, versus exactly uh, the things that people who are practicing this should go do currently. Um, so I, that's, that's just a little bit of nuance, but sort of figure out that stuff and, and, and the gaps. And I think that if you, it, it, that 
I, I'm just pushing for any of the things that are going to be the usage documents or the new gaps that we're going to fill to get very specific about those in the charter of what they're going to do and not have it be at all sort of open-ended. And of course, you won't get it right. You'll find some things that you missed or whatever. You'll recharter, you'll add those later. It's not, it's not expectation to get it perfect first time. It's just, here's our initial scope of work that bounds it and limits the amount of crap that people can bring in and force onto us and we can focus and get work done quickly because obviously, you, you know, this could turn into one of those things that you do go for 10 years and you haven't gotten anywhere. So we need to get it narrowed down. So thank you and I'm glad to see the work. Uh, Cedric? Hi, so I'm Cedric Fournay. I, I also find it very interesting, but I, in terms of scope, I'm not sure what is our workflow and what is not in this setting. In fact, uh, uh, we have seen uh, many ways of uh, composing tokens, of uh, uh, putting them into buckets, putting them, nesting them, uh, putting them into a graph. And a lot of that would apply generically to a kind of complex or compound identity. So I, I failed to get what is specific to a workflow as opposed to other uh, uh, open-ended uh, composition scenarios. Hey, Hannes? Yeah, I like what Cullen said, uh, like focusing more on, uh, or focusing on fine-tuning the use cases. Um, looks like uh, sort of like well-spent time we had initially confer uh, conference calls, separate conference calls and, and discussions on a list about those use cases and spending more time to sort of write them up uh, properly. I think that's good. Also the architecture uh, idea that uh, Eka brought up, I think that's also, that's also excellent because that's um, a better way to also explain um, how the security properties look like in these, in these container-based environments, which will also help to inform on how some of uh, the technologies are being used. So, so I think that's uh, limiting the scope and, and starting with that one first, yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, Roman. Hi, Roman Delilio again, kind of no hat. I I'm having trouble understanding some of the things that it got said at the mic line. I don't know how to square, we're gonna write down what we already know how to do and wanna make sure people know with then writing the architecture down, like in the new one. So is it that we're gonna write down the architecture that's implicit that folks don't have, and at the same time, we're gonna write the practices, or are we gonna write down how you could do it now, and then we're gonna describe the new architecture? So when we say architecture, I'm, I'm trying to kind of square that between new, old kind of work, or what, whatever we might do, and kind of those use cases, are the use cases for the best practices we were describing? So can, I, can someone help me out? Um, so I, I would, say, and this is honest, um, I would, I would see the architecture as, um, we've seen some of it in this, in the slides and there's obviously a lot of it in, for example, the spiffy documents and so on, but it's all pretty much scattered all over the place. Uh, and, but, and of course there's variation. So for example, um, whenever we was talking about the agent, um, using the, the spiffy identity documents, he was also showing, uh, probably not very prominent, there's actually interaction with the backend system, with the control plane. And that's technology that is, we are quite familiar with. Uh, it's used in different places, like in centrally, we are talking about uh, certificate management protocols, uh, because you need to fetch uh, credentials, you request credentials, you get credentials, you also provide attestations about the hosts you're running these workloads on, and, and so on and so on. And so describing that in a, in a little bit abstract form, um, not going into the specific incarnations, I think that's um, what I would have in mind uh, for, for a first step. It's not the architecture on how it should look like in the future, um, but it's like documenting how it's done now. So if I just follow up and repeat what I think I heard, acknowledging I'm not the, the deep expert in. So we're saying that things deployed in clouds with technologies like Docker and Kubernetes, this so very widely deployed thing used by very large companies ever, that's not written down anywhere. 
And so we need to write down this thing that's being used in cloud architectures kind of right now, kind of pervasively. And that's an important contribution because again, no one's written down this thing used in production by hundreds of thousands of people and companies right now. I'm, I'm just making sure. Yeah, I want to make sure. Yeah, it's, it sounds like kind of ridiculous that, I'm, that we are making that statement, but I had to look at code to find out like how some of that works. Uh, well, it's it's sort of like... It seems surprising. <laughs> it's crazy as that sounds yeah, yeah exactly uh, and i think I, so i mean architect you know architecture I, I i know when i see it um the 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 <laughs> It, the, the what I was sort of imagining, I think, was the the boxes and arrow style roadmap of how this is how these you know we need to transfer sort of this level of claim from here to here, and we're going to do it using approximately a spiffy thing. And there's a gap of there's here's some information we couldn't transfer that were identified. There. Just sort of a rough roadmap of how all the pieces piece together to um, to answer even sort of you know commonly deployed things of how we all run Kubernetes today, right? Um, which are is not done and it's it's not quite just like a matter of looking at the source because a bunch of this doesn't really quite work or people are taking horrible hacks to connect things together. Yeah, well, I, okay. I mean, so my clarifying question is, do we have a pattern of in the rest of the ITF where we documented someone else's architecture? And that was the contribution kind of we made because I'm riffing a little bit off Ecker said that like we, this one seems different if we're going to try to patch technologies we did not develop. And so can we learn lessons from how others have done? 3GPP documented our SIP architecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So one of the... Um... Uh, one of the problems here is that a lot of the sort of specific concerns uh, that people find when they go to actually deploy this stuff gets lost in like institutional knowledge or just in some engineer's head. And if they get hit by a bus, then that needs to be rediscovered by somebody else. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of to uh, Cedric's um, question earlier, like what are what is unique about a lot of this stuff? Um, so... Uh, we, we tried to we start capturing that in the use cases document. Some of this, like being able to make a hyper-local decision, right? That's not unique yeah. to this space specifically, but in context of everything else, it, it turns out to be very, very important when you have this, you know, random little Lambda function that uh, it does not have external connectivity and stuff. You need to be able to hand it enough information that it makes a decision and moves on with its day without having to go talk to somebody else. And the fact that like that is the context that this ends up getting uh, deployed to that type of um, knowledge gets uh, not necessarily lost, but it keeps getting rediscovered every time somebody needs to sit down and do this. And so preventing that rediscovery to some extent uh, should, I think, be a goal of this work um, by capturing the current practices, which are best, um, and uh, and also figuring out uh, what weird hacks people are doing that work that probably aren't great, but maybe we should write them down and put fences around them. Um, because I, I've seen a lot of weird stuff out there that people like. So uh, uh, Hannes didn't, I, I don't think he really got into it, that whole projected token thing. That It's a jot that shows up as a file on your Docker image. It's weird. But it works, kind of. And so it should have appropriate fences around it for people. You know, we don't think of OAuth tokens as files on the file system in the OAuth world. But people are doing it this way. And so this is exactly the kind of thing that we need to be able to start talking about and not only have the uh, sort of the common vocabulary for that, which I think we're also missing, um, but have an ability to discuss this in the kinds of context where you get this notion of, okay, yeah, you need it to be you know, like you know highly robust from disconnection. Okay, but why? What's driving that? Uh, you know, is that something that I'm allowed to skip because I think I'm smarter than uh, than the last person, or have I just not discovered that foot gun yet? Uh, thanks for the. Excellent input on think, how to think about the charter. Um, I think in response to the question about us documenting other people's stuff, in some ways it's us documenting our own stuff. Uh, these 
you know, folks go out, they adopt OAuth, and they do it in a way that nobody in the OAuth working group would have thought is a good idea necessarily or would have done. The, uh, <clears throat> well, I I'm, wouldn't be that judgmental. I mean, it has to work too, right? But the, the challenge that we then run into is, you know, somebody says, oh, well, I'm using OAuth. I'm using OpenID Connect. And, the, and of course, that becomes a switch for it must be secure. The IETF must have reasoned over this it must be okay to do these things. And evidently, maybe not, right? And so I think, and, and that's, you know, you, and you might say, well, so why, still, why should we care? The other challenge that we have is identity is sort of this huge ingress point for attacks on our infrastructure, all of our infrastructure. If I can fake an individual, I can do anything that individual can do. If I can fake a workload, I can do everything that workload can do. And that workload can do more than humans, right? The way we really don't have least privilege access today. So that's actually one of the things in the charter where we, we need to aim for that. But um, in the absence of good identity foundations, it's really hard to do least privilege access. And again, you know, so I think there's sort of this first step in with OAuth, making sure that that is being used properly. There's some very clear, like the things that Evan has pointed out, token theft, um, be having request constrained uh, tokens uh, immediately sort of takes away an entire attack vector for us. And so these are immediate things that we can go and solve. And again, I think that point, uh, I think um, Eric that you raised and, and Colin, right? Okay, we, if we need to write the charter that narrow, let's do it. But the more I see of the space, uh, I'm very sure we're gonna come back and recharter later on. But I appreciate the sentiment of not create a dumping ground for everybody else's stuff that got rejected in other places. So I definitely don't want that. So thank you. Uh, Hannes, um, Roman, you ask an interesting question, like are we documenting other people's work? And I would see it slightly different. Um, first of all, we Sorry, actually- Sorry, the, the queue is closed. I'm in the first in the queue. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but people are still doing Yeah, okay. Um, it's like we do that all the time. Uh, so if you look at suit, if you look at rats, if you look at um, deep, like there's typically we don't invent the technology. Like there's already something out there and then we start to standardize it. And, and so we need to document a little bit on like what are some of the implementations out there. And then as technology matures and people are interested in sort of munching things together, it then new sort of needs for collaboration arise. And in fact, actually, and that's something I'm quite thankful for, um, Eben, who came from that community, was able to, in the discussions, uh, give us some insight into the, the design rationale on some of the, the things um, that he was actually talking about today. And the, those groups have documented some of their stuff. It's just documented in a very different abstraction level that is unfamiliar for someone like me working in the IETF who cares about totally different things than they do. Um, and it's makes it that makes it inaccessible or, or quite difficult to access that information um, for, for, for someone else uh, working in those uh, projects. It's obviously, it's a piece of cake, but I think there's value in disseminating that information to this community also and to collaborating with them to actually then create something, um, a standardized solution that it has better security. Next. Uh, is, is that me? Hey, yeah, it's yeah, AJ. Okay. Uh, sorry, um, I can't really see that well at this point, but which is, I guess, scary for me. Hi, I'm AJ. Um, I'm sorry to be a broken record on this. Now I'm more confused. I understand and kind of align with what Anas just said, but I'm worried about what architecture we're defining. So I'm going to say something and people can tell me that's what we're talking about or I'm misguided and then I'll explain why I'm asking this. We're talking about identity and authentication as it pertains to identities in mostly workloads that we would see in the cloud. Is that, before I keep going, is that related? to Justin or anyone? Yeah. Okay. So what is the architecture we're looking at? Are we talking about the reference open source vanilla versions of Kubernetes? People here mentioned Docker. I assume they mean OCI container specifications because it's technically not Docker anymore. For both of those, there are dozens of different very large cloud scale or implementations, self quote unquote self-hosted implementations 
it's really hard for me to see where you draw the circle there and re-adopting fast growing technologies. Those are now very well adopted and fast sliding moving targets. I don't see how defining reference ar architectures, even if we're doing it from an IETF perspective and that's helpful, is not going to be really hard or something you have to rapidly update all the time. Most of the cloud vendors, despite what I think of their documentation, they have trouble keeping up and they often allow people in different ways to deploy multiple versions of these things in very heterogeneous, very conflicting architectures. That's it. So I don't think we, uh, this is Justin, I don't think we mean architecture quite as technology specific as you're saying in the end there. I think we're talking uh, in sort of broader strokes uh, that there, there is a thing known as a workload. It has instances and those instances get identified and they connect to each other. And that means particular things that it's terminology to, uh, uh, is what Leif just said. And I agree with that. And, and a threat model is what Ori said, cause nobody wants to come to the mic. So I'll just keep repeating things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's, but it's more at that level as opposed to you've got Kubernetes version, whatever version it is and Docker container uh, version X and, uh, and you're putting them together in this way. That's, I don't think that that's what this working group wants to do, nor, and I agree, nor should it do something at that level, uh, but instead be able to say that there's an image of software doing a thing and have a, have a name for that and have a, that be a well-defined name that we can then reason about. Okay. Well, it's hard for me to see how you could connect, like I guess what we'll call an information architecture or something else to not drag this out further well to things that are largely based on examples that we keep repeating as we describe it, which is why it's kind of worrisome. I've been down that road before. That's it. That doesn't mean the work yeah. isn't worth doing. I'm interested in it. I'm just saying. Sorry to, yeah, to interrupt. Uh, we're at nine minutes to the hour and we would like to go into both questions. So I think, I think what we want to try to do is get to you know, is, is, is there something of interest here? I know we have differences on how, uh, or, or we haven't quite gotten to a, a concise level of uh, charter or what would exactly be chartered, but I'd like to understand if people see this, is there work here that throughout we've, what we've discussed that is appropriate for the IETF? So, work associated with uh, workload identity uh, that that should be done in the IETF is, is the question, I think. Does that make sense to folks? Yeah, we're gonna run a poll. I just wanna put the question out there and make sure that we're, that this seems productive. Um, so. Is this the same? Yep. <laughs> well, within the context of what we've discussed today. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, the, the it says uh, 33 said yes, uh, four said no, and uh, there were 61 that uh, had no opinion. Um, for anybody who said no, if they would like to come to the mic and let us know if there's specifics that you'd like to give. Okay. Okay, so the, the next question is, we'd like to get an idea of how many people would actually contribute 
being that you know a number of people thought this was appropriate, but do we have people in this group who would author documents, review documents, um, you know, contribute text where needed? Um, so uh, this is the next question here, and that's uh, so including review. Yeah, I would say including review. I mean, review is uh, oh, okay. very important. If this was done in I, well, you can read the question in your thing, but would you contribute? Have a show of hands about implementation. No, let's go ahead. I think we don't know what the implementation will be. All right, uh, let's close this one. So we have uh, 34, I mean, 33, 4, 4, no, and then. No, no, no. Oh, That's sorry. 30, okay, uh, 34, 10, th 30 for yes, in favor, 10 knows and uh, 58 no opinions. So that shows uh, decent interest there. Um, I don't know if we want to get into any more, if we can get into any more specifics about who would implement, because I think, I, I don't know that we know what those deliverables are, but are there other questions that we should be asking at this point? From A. Francesca or Murray? So when this came up at dispatch, um, we weren't sure being, I'm saying we being the area directors, we're not sure whether this should be artwork or sec work. And the four of us are in the room and I don't think it's any clearer to us. So we think we would like to get some feedback from the room. Do any of you feel more strongly about whether it should go to one or the other? Okay, there's three areas for us to choose from now. <laughs> sec art, whimsy dispatch. Yeah, I mean, I asked a question. Sure. <laughs> uh, it, it feels like more art than sec to me, um, just because it, it feels like, unless you're going in to create a brand new, uh, like if you're making a new protocol token format that's specific to this, then it feels like more of a sec thing. But if you're talking about terminology and sort of ecosystem sort of alignment or documenting how people are doing this today, that feels more uh, like less sec. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, so I initially got up to say sec actually, and then Ori sort of half convinced me. Um, I, I guess, I think it really depends on what we're gonna do. Um, I think if it is going to be like, if it's going to be like mostly, um, you know, uh, you know, screwing around with the tokens go and like what's in the tokens, like that's like semantic, then is like an art kind of thing or a BCB as an art kind of thing. If it's going to be like the kind of stuff Justin presented about the, uh, uh, you know, with, with the hashes or, or, or I'm sorry, I didn't catch the guy's name, but, the, but um, you know, um, but with, you know, the, the, the aggregate signatures, then I think it obviously has to be in a sec. Um, and so I actually would suggest that like, we try to like nail down the charter first. And then like, if it turns out that we're going to do actually both kinds of things, then like, hey, you know, it wouldn't be that worst thing in the world to actually have like another working group that like, it's like, these guys are token formats and these guys are going to do this. Um, so I think maybe like try to work out like what actually we're going to do first and then we can yeah. figure out who owns it. Um, can, I, can I plus one what Eckert just said? Or int could take it. <laughs> they, they don't have enough to do. Yeah. <clears throat> but for now it's Francesca and could you please uh, close us off? Thank you for a very uh, good discussion. Um, yes, I've heard a lot of opinions. I mean, I'm really, uh, the positive point is that there is a lot of interest. It's still not very clear um, what the scope around what is proposed is. I think that this was 
to bring like the, the presentations I heard was a lot of, you know, there is a lot of interest, there is a lot, you know, of people who are willing to participate. And so I think that we should work or on a charter in the mailing list and definitely like, let's not boil the ocean. Is that the, the saying? <laughs> so that's going to be a, a fundamental point for this to be able to move forward because if it's way too much or way too open, it's never going to like get approved anyway. So yeah. thank you. So thank you for running this as well. Thank you very much. Never use the word architecture at the idea. Yeah, well, there, there's that, and then I probably would have, should have taken a closer look at some of the presentations because they got way too much. I don't know, it's hard. Actually, I wasn't surprised. So, would you say sector or art? No, I was just like, what? I don't know, it's uh, yeah. this I'm mic there. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, it's not obvious to me what they're going to do. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Like if, it, if they're building new token formats, like, I like the, I like the, framing of the problem actually like i felt like the, the workload identity piece like what, what what's, what's it doing what's the problem i actually felt like that was i understand that but what are, what are we gonna do that's great you know like <laughs> yeah turns out like kubernetes is complicated yeah, like yeah okay i have more questions well office here yeah I guess maybe this is an idea. <laughs>